This is a Full and Bloom interview with producer Rick Browdy. To gain more insight into Poison's Look What the Cat Dragged In, be sure to listen to our interview with producer engineer Jim Faraci. Click the link in the description. When we initially spoke, you mentioned something about Nikki Six. What do you remember about him? Yeah, I mean, in those days, Nikki had two pairs of pants, and he was, he still is a really nice guy, but he was a shrewd businessman, and you know, my wife later was part of his management team, which was pretty funny. So, wow, um, got to see a different side of him, and at that point, you know, it's much later in his career, and I think the world of Nikki. I think he's uh, he was very, you know, he lent us a bass to use on the Faster Pussycat album. Actually, um, he's just a good guy. I have nothing but respect for that guy. What did you say about Faster Pussycat? He lent us uh, the bass that Eric played on. You know, I remember him coming over one day and playing Girls, 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 you know, the mix. I was like, going, ooh, this is going to be huge. I had some very good times with Nicky. Um, he used to hang out a lot. Molly used to hang out when we were doing the Herman Rarebell solo album. And with Wasp, he was around a lot afterwards. And it just always was struck by he had a vision. He understood everything. He may not have gone to college, but he was like one of the smartest people I've met in rock and roll. You know, in terms of got a vision, I understand it. I know what my problems are. I'm stuck with this singer who I personally can't stand, but life goes on. Nicky's just a really shrewd guy. You can tell by the way he talks that he may not have much education, but you can tell he's incredibly intelligent. He's not that, you know, he's not some dumb kid from Idaho. He may play himself off that way sometimes just to disarm you, but the guy's shrewd and he's one of those people you, you just have to respect if you get to know him. You know, I've seen him in 20 years, probably, but um, just totally respect the guy. He pretty much does everything himself. You know, he imaged the band and uh, realized what branding was all about. Oh, definitely so, that. Yeah. And so, yeah. I mean, that time's even before Shout at the Devil, right? From day one, I remember receiving Herman Rarebell and I were living together. And uh, back before Motley did the first album, and we got this videotape of them rehearsing in a their living room on Clark Street, and they wanted Herman to produce them. And I remember looking at that and going to Herman, "You should go sign these guys. These guys are amazing. There's no way they won't make it." And Herman's like, "I don't have no time." And he's like, "But I should do it." And never, you know, never was able to, you know, to make the time to do it. So his friend Michael Dogner did it. Well, our mutual friend Michael Dogner and. Uh, it went from there, and everything was amazing. I may not be a fan of their music stylistically, but it's just so clever, so well done. How do you end up being roommates with Herman? Well, I guess a formal is when the last tour that I did with Ted Nugent, uh, where we were doing a live album, Intensities, um, the opening acts, both on their first American tour, were the Scorpions and Death Leopard. And because all of us hated Ted, we always hung up with hung out with the opening acts. And Herman and I became really fast friends, and you know, at, at the time. And so when he was, he would always come over to New York. He would live at my house. And then when I came out to, he asked me to come do his solo album, and uh, we put it together. And so I was living with him in Redondo Beach. And then when I went to do Victory, I was living at his apartment in um, in Hanover, Germany. We just became friends, and then um, he got involved with this this woman um, who became a dear friend of mine. It was a former penthouse centerfold and hooker and named Pammy Ventrella, and she was having an affair with Bruce Johansson, who you know was C.C. DeVille. And as a favor to her, I did Poison. So you know, it was all like everything you see out of Los Angeles music in those days even though I was living in New York and sort of straddling New York, Germany and Los Angeles, everybody was in every other band and knew everybody else. And it was just like one giant Petri dish. And so, you know, people were having sex with various things. So uh, Bruce Johansson was having sex with Tammy Ventrella, who was married to Herman and, you know, <laughs> was like begging me to go see her boyfriend's band. So, oh, you know, wow. things like that. So, uh, <sighs> Incredible. I know it's a quick record, but I yeah, typically... Do, I mean, there's not much to say about the Poison album. I'll give it to you very briefly. 
we did the album at Music Grinder Studios in Hollywood, which isn't there anymore. But um, the whole album cost twenty three grand. That was the budget, including everything: travel, producers, advance, mixing. The way we got it was uh, Stevie Nicks had booked out the studio, but she was so coked out she would never show up. So we made a deal for cash to the guys that worked at the studio. Um, they didn't tell the owner that we were there, I'm sure, and they just kept the cash. You know, but if the fat bitch ever got you know, ever showed up, which she never did, we would have to vacate the place really quickly. And that was how we were able to do an album. And Music Grinder is a studio that repeatedly shows up in these interviews. It was kind of known to be an affordable studio with great gear, right? It didn't have that, oh, I don't know if it was great gear. I mean, it had decent, decent gear. It wasn't A&M, it wasn't a record plant. It was serviceable. Recording studios are usually overrated, to tell you the truth, because if you don't have whatever it is, the feeling, no matter how good the studio is, unless you're Mud Lang, probably, and he just is at a plane above everybody else, so, you know, you just bow down and say, you're the Mud Lang, so it's going to be a hit. But um, for garbage producers like me and, you know, most producers, it's what you make of whatever band you're in, because nobody, no, maybe there's three or four audiophiles in the world, but certainly none of them listen to 80s music out of L.A., but you're capturing an emotion. You're not capturing... You know, you're not, it's not an art. It's all, you know, it's like if you capture the energy and the emotion and you got a, you got a imaging and poison with the triumph of image over substance, you feel have success. And if you have a record company behind you, and we were fortunate enough to have Capitol Records having fired their entire A&R staff and only having two bands that they could work for the next nine months, the Austin Crowded House. And so they had to devote their, their promotion departments to those two bands because they had nothing coming out in the pipeline because they dropped everything from the previous administration. So um, it's just a fortuitous thing. But it really, the studio is just such a small part of the success or failure of any record. It's just a tool. So producers have their own comfort level at any studio. I never, I never thought of a studio as, you know, I mean, I, I could appreciate a great furnished studio, things like that, but I never viewed it as a, uh, an impediment or a success, you know, the reason an album was successful. It just really was immaterial. And it's capturing that but, energy. Yeah, I'm, I'm, but, you know, I'm not a great producer. I was known as a garbage producer, and that's probably what I was. I've recorded in, you know, some great studios like the Hit Factory in New York with Joan Jett and the album worked really well and was successful. But, you know, it's just like it was capturing the spirit, not capturing the sound quality. I mean, Mud Lang can do that, you know, but Mud Lang is a god, you know, we all know that. Uh -huh. But, um, you know, it's it's just audiophiles of just like you see all these albums from the original masters and you just have to laugh because first of all the original masters even the regular public when they were originally released um they only made like 25 to, the most they'd make is 250,000 records in the, new, the original mastering of any record because um they made stampers and things like that and they only made them for the, that amount the guy who did the original mastery everything else was a copy and they go from the original tape they're not from the original tape just you know, cleaned up digitally audio a little bit more lip compression limiters and this that and the other things it's, it's just all it's all music's all a con job do you go see Poison prior to no. recording them yeah actually that's why I signed yeah, Tammy begged me to go we went to a place called the Country Club in Re it was a club in Reseda California and I was out here and I went and the place was packed and the band was horrible but i think the place had a 1200 seat capacity and a thousand of people there were girls and everyone wanted to fuck the band afterwards and you go damn if they can if the girls are there and they're wanting to fuck the band like they did and they did i mean brett michaels was a hottie and the rest of them you know, did pretty well for themselves as well all you have to do is write some passable songs and capture it and where girls are guys will follow so i agreed to do the album they've been rejected by every label so i agreed to do this and one day there was a small label called enigma and one thing led to another and there they were so and then the promotion came from capital i know that that was yeah, like their little initially so from enigma but enigma was in financial difficulty so they sold to tom wally at capital who later became interscope's big guy and capital had not they dropped everything their a and r because they were such a considered such a they were like mca you know really shitty label at that point and so they had nothing to you know until their new a and r people's acts 
went and delivered their albums. They had nothing to work on. There was a guy, there was the head of promotion was a guy named Walter Lee, who later, you know, during that period got arrested for using a cattle prod on his uh, promotion staff, you know, and things like that. It was all, it was all you know, just scandals and this, that, and the other thing. That's pretty incredible because I've never heard that side of it. So that's the only reason they kind of promoted yeah. them more. It, yeah. I mean, it was just that, and then they made those videos, more girls, more things, and Poison were calling in to MTV. You know, they were hiring people to call MTV, and you know, things things happened. As far as being prepared, were they pretty easy to work with? Did things move quickly? Or? No, no, they, they moved quickly. We'd do a song a day start to finish, basically, because that way we didn't have to break down, and uh, we just kept everything going. And... Um, the drummer was really, really horrible. Ricky and, Rock, yeah. uh, the nicest guy, and you know, really nice guy. I mean, I, I can't say anything bad about him, but uh, he wasn't very. Not, you know, none of them were musical virtuosos, except for Bruce. Bruce was pretty. Bruce was the only competent one, but um, you know, we had to. None of them had really recorded. Bruce didn't even. Bruce kept talking to me about like leaving the band because he had another band that he was thinking of joining and things like that. It's just we were in the right place at the right time. It was a triumph image over substance. Brett Michaels was incompetent, um, but it worked. I mean, and in a lot of ways, I feel that we were kind of a landmark album because we opened up the music business. You know, we removed the barrier of the barrier to entry used to be being able to sing in tune and and have talent, and we removed that. So it was good. As far as cutting his vocals, like, what do you consider your job as a producer? Are you just looking for the, you the one calling the person? Energy and energy and being relatively close to being in tune. <laughs> right. We did a couple of weeks of rehearsal where I had to rearrange everything and stop them from being a heavy metal band because they weren't going to be Kiss. And um, realizing that we had to put as many gimmicks in there as possible and then deal with, you know, there are, you know a ton of lawsuits about songs that they plagiarized and they had to pay out a lot of money on those. And, you know, life goes on. It was just, there's not much to be said about Poison. It was nine days of misery and got the album done and, and then splicing it together and there it was. Did you have a process on like cutting vocals? You know, a lot of the guys I've talked to said they do like five passes through it and then comp the vocals. Did you do anything like that with Brett? Uh, I think we pretty much went line by line with him. Uh, he he was just so out of tune. You know, there was just like, he just reminded me of Alfalfa, the little rascals, you know. I mean, by, if I get here behind the bushes, he just couldn't get that in tune. Talk dirty to me, you know, it was just like, he, he wasn't a good singer. I mean, he looked great. Girls wanted to fuck him, and that's all I counted. So, Did you think Talk Dirty to Me would blow up like it did? I thought that and Cry Tough were the two songs that were going to be the winning songs. And Cry Tough was actually a song that I wrote with a German guy named Mario Timma. Uh, we run a song called Out in the Streets, and it's dead note for note. It was just an arrangement with their lyrics on it. But I thought it was a good anthem. Wow. And did you get, um, I know it says that they wrote all the songs on the back. Yeah, but then there were lawsuits behind it. And yeah, all, you know, what's just, funny you know, is I had heard just probably two, three, four years ago, it was some other I band. Action was written by, remember a band called Easy Action, and then there was a guy named Zinni Zack. Um, what was that band called? They were a Finnish band that were around. Oh, uh, like Shotgun Messiah? Yeah, Shotgun Messiah. And Zinni wrote that song. And I remember telling Zinni, I was like, going, Zinni, did you hear this? This is I Want Action. You know, and their song, I Want Action Tonight. This is a dead riff. So there was all sorts of lawsuits on that, that, that album. And they were all settled quietly behind. And I had to sue Poison to get my money because of the lawsuits about their plagiarism. You had a lawsuit with them? Yeah. It settled out of court. I'm not, there's a settlement, you know, there's a non disclosure agreement, but I had a considerably more money than, you know, they, they tried to, it was a lawyer's wet dream, that album. <laughs> <laughs> but didn't you get points being a producer? Didn't you get I, points? I, I did. Okay. But I had to go to court to get paid. Oh, to get paid on your points? Yeah, because, yeah, Smallwood, Smallwood and the band tried to blackmail me into supporting in their uh, plagiarism suits. And I was like, oh, you know, sorry, I'm not going to do that. I know that album took like, what, nine months or several months before it took off, right? 
Yeah, it took a, it was, well, I don't think it was released for quite a few months. And then um, it was really funny. Um, I was going to, uh, the Motley Crue's manager at the time was a guy named Doc McGee. Sure. And he's legendary. And Doc was getting married. And he was getting a, and, and he uh, had a reception aboard the Circle Line and this boat that goes around Manhattan. And, uh, you know, we're going, and I went, my wife was an executive with Polygram. And Derek Schulman, who later became a record cup, was the lead singer of General Diamond and became a, a big A&R guy. I did Motley Crue, I signed uh, Bon Jovi, Cinderella, and, you know, could do no wrong, and then became the president of Avco Records, where <laughs> totally collapsed. But uh, Derek's like going, congratulations. And I'm like, congratulations on what? And he goes, Poison's on the charts. So I'm like, what? You know, because I came home from doing that album. And I remember telling my wife, this is the biggest piece of shit I have ever done. I can't believe I did this. This is just so, so awful, this record. And she's going, I like it. And I'm like, God, I never trust you again. <laughs> and um, so he's like telling me to poison fit the charts. So I'm like, what the fuck? And it was, you know, I went out and got Billboard and there it was. Like, it's like 196 or something. I have no idea. You know, but he's like, and he's going, I think it's going to be big. He was English. And I'm like, no, it can't be. And then every week it would go up and go up and go up. And I remember I was doing Faster Pussycat, I think it was, at Amiga Studios. And Michael Wagner, who's was a close friend of mine and was the engineer who did the mixes uh, with Poison. Right. Um, was in doing White Lion and I was doing Faster Pussycat and, you know, Jason Studios and Amigo Studios. We had this thing where it's like, I said, as it was like shooting up the charts, it's going to number one. Bon Jovi was like ahead of us forever. We, I think we peaked at number two. And I was like, going, you know, I said, well, I'll fly everybody to France for dinner if we go to number one and never did make it. But the funny thing was um, when we went to mix the album, Michael had the option of a point or $2,500 to do that. To do the mixes, right? And he poison. took he took the cat. I he took the twenty five hundred. Because right. <laughs> unfortunately, he blames me, and he has every right to. Because I said I, I said to him, it was like you'll never see a dime. That album <laughs> sucks. <laughs> so Michael is like, I mean, he's such a good natured guy. He's he's one of the truly wonderful people of rock and roll. And you look at the albums that he's done, and oh my god, he's he's done so well for oh, himself. Oh, huge, huge and fan of still, his work. Still turning yeah. yeah. out. And He's just the sweetest, nicest human being. So, you know, it was just, it's, it's always been a joke. Every time we've seen each other, every time we talk to each other, you know, he's just, he's, he's just, just a brilliant guy. I ended up doing five albums with him in collaboration with him. Did you so really? Which people. which ones? He, let's see, he mixed the first, the first and second Victory albums, uh, Poison, um, what else did we do? Uh, uh, this horrible thing called Smash Gladys. Oh yeah, I remember them. And um, and Herman Rarebell. Yeah. Oh. You produced that Smash Gladys album? Yeah. There was a time, probably around 2000, that I did, um, I would sell CDs. I'd go into pawn shops and then... And sell them for a lot. Yeah, yeah. like $100, $200, man, over I, and I over. I can never understand that for Smash Gladys. What a, you know, that was a huge yeah. seller. It was like when I found I that... I know. I, I kept hearing about that. People would like go, you know, 200 bucks for a thing. And it was like, you know, it was, I don't know. There, there was... It was Abomination. That's incredible. Did you ever come across Great White at all? Yeah, uh, when we were doing Herman Rarebell's solo album, uh, Jack sang some of the lead vocals. We started with um, the original version had this German guy, and we replaced him, and we used Jack. We started using um, Stephen Percy, but he was he couldn't cut it, and so Don Dawkins and Jack ended up singing most of that album. That was going to be the next question. I'm sure you came across Don Dockin as well, because him and Michael were really good friends. But um, They were living together. And yeah, I think that Don may have been the one who introduced me to, to Michael. It's funny, and Don moved down the street from where I used to live. And, you know, so I, you know, constantly, know, you know, I was hyper aware. We were, I wouldn't say we were close, but we were friendly, you know, and I used to see him in George Lynch's sight all the time. And, uh, and then being sued by his band for his own name, last name, which I was pretty funny. What was it like recording Jack? His voice is pretty incredible. He was he was really together. I mean, the guy belted it out. 
Yeah, he's a good singer. Nice enough guy. He drank a lot. But nice enough guy. I'd give him an A. He was, he was a nice guy. He just wasn't. He went and did his job, and that was that. The hero on the album to me was Stevie Marriott, because he did one track, and he was just like, one take, done. And our engineer and I looked at each other and like, going, do you do any better? Do you make sure you have that on record? Yeah, okay, good, because it, you know, it was perfect. Was that a common thing, where sometimes you'd do line by line? Very, very rarely. You know, sometimes with some of the foreign bands that I did, where pronunciation was just so right. difficult for them, and they'd be singing in a language that they don't speak, you'd sometimes get that, but... Um, no, normally it was, normally what I would do is I just have people sing it through and then, you know, figure out what needed to be replaced, what needed to be better, and maybe even take two or three things and cop them and, and then take, you know, this from, you know, track one, this from track two, this from track three, and assemble it that way and then try and top it again. There are various things, but usually what I always went for, because I always felt that um, as much spontaneity as possible should be kept on an album. I liked keeping the band together, and that's why I liked doing a song a day start to finish. Was um, It was best to just let somebody go for it, because you know if they got into the song and they started feeling the song, they'd start getting it. And if you start interrupting them and making them concentrate on one particular thing, then you're just you're sapping the spirit of them. That was my belief. Not that it's right or wrong, but it's just the way I felt. You said um, when you were cutting the Faster Pussycat, he's doing that White Lion record. Do you have any White Lion? Um, Greg D'Angelo, the drummer, is one of my really close friends to this day of White Lion. Um, I, I, you know, also, most of my White Lion stories are sort of secondhand, but I think the funniest thing was that uh, the singer in White Lion, Mike Tramp, um, like so many people in rock and roll, thought, you know, he was going to be the huge star because they had that big hit. And so he went and bought a, a house out of a catalog and had this house custom made. But unlike most people, he didn't buy a piece of land to put the house on. His career hit the skids and he had the first homeless house. <laughs> so he bought this, he had this huge house and they had, they had it on a trailer and they dumped it on Malcolm Forbes' estate <laughs> since he couldn't pay for it. You know, I thought that was just really, really funny. But um, I don't have you know many stories of White Lion. I mean, Greg is, Greg is still one of my dear friends, and I'm aware of the politics of the band. And Greg is one of the, the smartest people in rock and roll, and one of the nicest people. And he was in Anthrax for a while, I think, in the very he was early original. Yeah. yeah, he just did something with the, he just did something with the original singer of Anthrax, or original guitar player of Anthrax, and he was doing something. And he's played with Ozzy, and he was playing with Stephen Piercy, and he was doing some rap things. And, you know, he, you know he, he makes far more money doing what he does now. So. He had his own studio, is that right? Yeah. Okay. I recorded there, and um, I recorded one of my albums, did a lot of recording up there, a lot of mixing there. He mixed one of my, my the last album I did with this Italian band that I wrote all the songs for. It was really, did an amazing job. When was that? What year was your last record? I think it was about four years ago. Oh, years okay, ago. so you're still kind of doing stuff through the years? Yeah, I mean, I... You know, I, I don't work in the United States ever, but um, once I really got into this charity, I've had no time. I've been offered quite a few things. Charity takes this, uh, it's about a light day for me. is like 14 hours, seven days a week. I mean, I do not take time off. So, so. And you're still married to the same lady from back in the 80s? 42 years. Holy shit. Day. What's yeah. the secret? Woke her up a few years ago and said, had I killed you when I met you instead of married you, I'd be off parole by now. But um, <laughs> she, she's, uh, she's one of the stupidest people on earth. I mean, she's um, she went to Columbia Law School. She went to Wellesley, then Columbia Law School. She never even figured out that divorce was legal. I can't figure it out. But, um, <laughs> she's my best friend, and I could not live without her. I just think she's just, you know, an incredibly wonderful human being. And she was an so, executive at Polygram? She was an executive at Polygram, and she was at Left Bank Management, managing Marley Crew at one point. Was at Disney for many years as well. She still represents a few bands and things like that, and, you know, like Tower of Power. And I met her at Max's Kansas City when I was just starting out, August of 1977. She was starting Columbia Law School, and we got married in December of 78. That's incredible, man. Yeah, kind of weird to be married, you know, especially for two people from broken homes. But uh, she comes from a long line of songwriters, and um, she's just one of the 
most amazing people I know. Would she ever talk Motley Crue stuff? She might. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, probably she's she's very into privileged communications and things like that. So I don't know what she would uh, she would tell. I mean, uh-huh. she's nothing but complimentary about them. But she was there during the John Karabi days, and who is just an, just one of our favorite people. But uh, she was the instrumental when Vince came back, and I don't think she's very positive about him. But very few people are. She's been around rock and roll all her life, and uh, she's just a great human being. She's got a different perspective. Exactly. Sometimes that's kind of a cool thing. Yeah. So, uh, so what's the what's like the thing you remember most about that Poison record? I I don't think about Poison to tell you the truth. Yeah. You know, I have never listened to the record subsequently. You know, every now and then I'll hear it. it's to the point where I'll hear it. Somebody will play it. I mean, it was embarrassing the other day. I was in um, Fort Worth, Texas, doing a flight. This 40-year-old woman came up to me. You know, she was like in her 30s. Excuse me, I'm sorry. And she came up to me and said, because of you, I was born. And I'm like, what the fuck are you talking about? And she was just like, oh, yeah, my parents went to a poison gig and Talk Dirty to Me was her favorite song. And my dad seduced my mom by telling her to talk dirty and they ended up fucking and there I am. <laughs> you know, it's, 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 you know, I mean, I don't, I don't, you know, the only albums I ever listened to that I did, and I think they're the two best albums, actually there's a third album that I, that I would listen to again. There was Flies on Fire, which were never big, but was the best album I did. I remember Dog, them, yeah. And, and Dogs to More. Of course. The album I did with them and they're my closest friends, they're my closest friends on the planet and, you know, they're, they're basically my family, like literally and, I was just in Florida this past weekend with the drummer, who's Bam, like my, my Bam, yeah, who's like and Cher from Vixen. Right, you know, they're they're like my best friends, and Joe, the guitar player from from uh, um, the Dogs, are my closest. I have no children of my own, but I view them as my family. I'm very close to Bam's mom and brothers, and those are the albums I listen to musically that I'm proud of, and one of the Italian albums I did, those are the albums that I'm proud of, and that I can listen to. The rest of the albums that I record, I keep the album in my collection and never never play it again, never never listen to it. I'll, I'll every now and then hear Babylon by Faster Pussycat, and I'm friends with Tammy still, and, uh, you know, and they go, yeah, that's kind of cool. It's just not a... <laughs> It, not, nothing really resonates for, for me, for my career. Now, when I interviewed Bam way back, he was doing the raw diet. Does he still do that? Yeah, I mean, we went to an Indian restaurant. I, I mean, he, you know, they had a very vegetarian thing. And he's making his, you know, he's he's doing his silver business. He's doing really well with. And Cher is now doing kick-ass in real estate while, you know, doing weekend fixing gigs back when until COVID. Um, Bam is the most talented human being in anything. Bam could read a book on brain surgery tonight and perform an operation tomorrow and it'd be perfect. I mean, he is the most artistic, most, he, he is to me the most interesting human being on the planet. <laughs> he really is. He is, you know, he did things like he designed my house and did all these faux paintings and secret rooms and things like that. And it's just incredible. He's just insanely talented guy and joe is you know not no slouch either that was the amazing thing about the dogs the more it's all four of them more were that way but they were probably still wasted at that time right they were quite a bit wasted yep they were totally fucked up when i interviewed them i can't remember maybe 15 years ago something like that but it, i remember thinking like he was attributing his survival to um uh to what is it Cher is that her name yeah okay yeah she, her bass player Vixen right but he had said that it was really her that he absolutely. would he would be dead you know without her yeah uh, absolutely he's totally clean still and all that totally nice totally you know happily married they just had their 20th anniversary or, or maybe it was 25 I can't remember what it was but yeah they're just incredible people totally in love and they moved to Florida and they're doing really well and you said he was in the silver business mm-hmm he okay. designs the silver stuff. It's really cool. And um, everything he does is just incredible. They did an album last year that was together. They had this this thing, and it was just it was really, really good. Um, and Tyler's you know, still alive? I think so. He's the only one that, you know, none of us, he's uh, a piece of work. He screwed the he screwed the other guys so badly in that band, and uh, 
become a caricature of himself. I think he lives in Sweden now. He's like on his fourth wife. He's just the, you know, you look at what he's accomplished since the band as it was left and uh, you see that he was, the band was bigger than Tyla and Tyla never realized that. And I saw it in the studio and I love that album. And I love Tyla, but you know, like anybody, he will, cons- that gets involved with him, he, he will use you up and then turn on you. And he's done that to everybody in his life consistently. So he's his own worst enemy. Don't 